Dr. Zabit Patterson. Zabit Patterson is a force. Since completing a PhD in rhetoric at UC Berkeley in 2007, she's not only taken up an assistant professorship in the art department at Stony Brook, but also has a forthcoming book with MIT Press, a manuscript in the works, and as we will hear today, another project simmering low on the back burner, not to mention countless presentations, as well as articles and curated exhibitions. While the numbers are impressive, it's the caliber and intrigue of Dr. Patterson's work on the often overlooked history of art and computational technology in the post-World War II era that really stands out. I first encountered Dr. Patterson's work earlier this year while doing research for a course that I was teaching on history of the media work. While historical narratives surrounding the Bell Laboratories are many, critical explorations and analyses of their artistic or graphical output are shockingly few. The reason for this is frequently explained as being twofold. Uh, the first is that much of the work uh, that was being created was purportedly created for scientific and technological purposes rather than in the name of art. Uh, the second reason was that there was a general disavowal of the computational by prominent artists of the time, particularly those affiliated with conceptualism, as a result of the integral role, uh, as a result of its integral role within the burgeoning military industrial complex of the late, late 1960s. It is that this complex access between the artistic, the technological, the scientific, and troubling the militaristic read violent, uh, that Patterson excavates and populates a rich historical analysis of forgotten media works. In her article on Kenneth Knowlton and Stan van der Beek's poem field, she transforms a seemingly primitive piece of computer animated cinema into a consciously insightful meditation on the emerging, though still very much elusive, materiality of digital imaging. Uh, selfishly, I really appreciated one of the last lines of this piece uh, that talked about the computational as a new material uh, for art. This kind of rich excavation was also present in an earlier publication, From the Gun Controller to the Mandela, the Cybernetic Cinema of John and James Whitney. While this article traces the dubious history of early analog computer graphics, it undercuts the seeming perfection of vision that the machine offers to demonstrate how in lapis and permutations the Whitney brothers offered a peek at the non-representational, a means of accessing pure perception. Uh, this is a significant recasting of the machine, not as a means towards an alternate political system in which art goes out into technology, uh, say in the name of the Russian constructivists, Billy Kluber, uh, or Jack Bernays, but instead as a technological means through which to envision an undefined, as of yet unrepresentable otherwise. Uh, shifting gears and only slightly today, Patterson will be discussing tech, sex, and the speculative fiction of J.G. Ballard. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, and I'm looking forward to the talk. Thank you so much, Ashley, and thank you, Patrick, for inviting me to speak in this. This is, as was noted, a little bit afield from some of my other work, but it is, for me, it's about kind of Whereas some of my other work is on computational materiality, this is about the scientific rhetoric, the ways in which the bureaucracy of science and its language works through conceptualism and language in this time period as well. So this is going to be on the Atrocity Exhibition by J.G. Ballard and specifically looking at the pornographic imaginary that I believe haunts and animates the Atrocity Exhibition. So what is the Atrocity Exhibition? It's a very strange book. It's described to some places as a flickering video collage in written form. It's comprised of six, 15 sections. Ballard called them a series of condensed novels. It moves at the outer limits of literary form, a structure between poetry and prose. It's interspliced with images that are both textual and pictorial, photographs that dissolve into sky and landscape, and illustrations that both mimic and parody conventional medical diagrams. The tone is perversely deadpan. The text is impacted in the sense of a tooth or a fracture. There is a continual refraction of character, plot, and narrative. Figures, images, and tropes echo one another across the sections, setting the whole into this kind of constantly shifting motion. Characters change names. They die. 
repeatedly. They're fragmented, they're mimetically refigured in a sprawl of individual body parts. Interior and exterior worlds become not so much muddled as profoundly inextricable. In short, the atrocity exhibition is a text which is very difficult to pin down. However, it's also a text about how we go about pinning things down, locating and classifying through description, through diagrams, through measurement, and through the creation, overarchingly, of precise, repetitive lists. Yet, like a renewed Manhattan Project, the scientific rhetoric of the atrocity exhibition is ultimately dedicated towards destruction. William Burroughs described the book as a munition, literally blowing up the image. He went on to say that since people are made out of image, this is literally an explosive book. Karen Beckman argues, discussing Crash, that the text move beyond the limits of the material body, imagining movements and intersections that a biologically based conception of sexual difference might foreclose. It allows the possibility of folding the newly imagined movements in intersections of mediums back onto the body, perhaps transforming the seemingly fixed limits of the body in that process. I would argue that the atrocity exhibition is dedicated to doing something very similar and that it offers similar possibilities. Prior to the atrocity exhibition, Ballard's books and short stories were far more linear in their construction, much more typically narrative. But once he moved into writing the atrocity exhibition, he was seeking to engage with a world that he argued simply couldn't be understood in these terms. So instead, he moves onto themes, obsessions, we might call them, which recur in an almost traumatic repetition throughout the book. Celebrity, Elizabeth Taylor, James Dean, Jacqueline Kennedy, accidents, automobiles, death, photography, cinema, trauma, psychoanalysis, car parks, exchange circuits, pornography. Some of these themes look forward to Ballard's better known work, Crash, and some of his other writings. However, in some sense, you can find the genesis of these works in the Atrocity Exhibition. It is densely, endlessly referential continually re resisting any kind of fixity. It explodes outward. The terms, events, figures, and tropes continually slip and slide. They're continually redetermined. Characters, scenes, incidents, and events appear and reappear in different contexts. The text is fundamentally unstable. It continually rewrites itself. And it doesn't rewrite itself in the sense of an either or. It's always operating in this gesture of and, and, and. And what this generates is a sense of bodies and events that don't have clearly defined limits. This makes sense for a text which is this fundamentally disjointed. Ballard originally published the material in a number of strikingly different forms and contexts before it was collected as the Atrocity Exhibition. A number of sections were printed as short stories in various magazines, Encounter, ICA Event Sheet, Transatlantic Review, The International Times. One of the short stories, Why I Want to Fuck Ronald Reagan, was initially published in 1968. It was in a small booklet by Bill Brighton who ran something called the Unicorn Bookshop. And as a result of his distribution of this booklet along with works by Burroughs and Bataille, he was charged with selling obscene materials, and the works were confiscated. The trial ended on a technicality, and the charge against the Reagan piece was dropped on the grounds that the envelope containing the seized copy was sealed. Two years later, a similar strategy of containment was required when Doubleday, a week prior to the scheduled June 1970 release, decided to pull the atrocity exhibition from their publication list. The head of Doubleday demanded not only that production be canceled, but that all extant copies of the book be destroyed, 
due to its libelous and obscene nature. It was then picked up by Dutton, who also decided that the book was libelous and obscene and therefore unpublishable for the American market. It was eventually gathered and published in the UK in 1970 by Jonathan Cape Press as the Atrocity Exhibition. However, and I find this fascinating, the first edition was published in Denmark by Rodos Press. So what I want to do for a little bit is look at some of the visual rhetoric around that circulates around this text by looking at some of the covers. So this is kind of blurry, it's tricky to see, but it's a car crash. And the obvious reference for this first published cover was Andy Warhol's 1964 Death and Disaster series, which is a bright single note aquamarine printing of a post-accident documentary shot of the inside of a wrecked car with a partial vision of a lifeless occupant, clearly mirroring the aesthetic of a work like Saturday Disaster from 1963. And a similar aesthetic, serial repetition continually with the difference, is at work in this early printing of Why I Want to Fuck Ronald Reagan, which was done in the International Times. And this is a close-up from another section of this. So you've got this blood-red text on this very Warholian background of serial repetition. But again, it's always repetition with a difference. For Warhol, as for Ballard, there isn't any such thing as an exact repetition. When the Atrocity Exhibition was eventually published in the US in 1972 by Grove Press, it took on a very different title, Love and Napalm, Export USA. It went after that out of print in, in print until 1990, when it was published as the Atrocity Exhibition, the title Ballard had originally intended by research publications, extensively annotated with new illustrations and photos, and added on to with several additional short stories. So again, this is a text which is tricky to pin down. It occurs and reoccurs in various formats. Illustrations appear, they vanish, Ballard adds annotation, he adds additional materials. And so it's kind of, it's constantly swirling. It's never entirely stable. So the transition between the Atrocity Exhibition and Love and Napalm Export USA is instructive in both imagery and valence of the types of fears and containment that are necessitated by this not quite a novel, novel that Ballard has written. This is the first cover of the Atrocity Exhibition. It shows a body, female, of course, divided into open components, which are all in the process of spilling out. And the cover for the pulped USA edition which is definitely not identical in any stretch of the imagination. It's sanitized compared to the original publication from the UK. Nevertheless, shows a very similar concern with the atomization of the body and kind of the translation and fusing of the body and the inanimate. In the first one, You've got the body fused with these kind of dresser drawers, something man-made, like a terraced building or something. In the second, the body fuses with this abstract idea of landscape, figure. Both, I would argue, are concerned with seeing and not seeing, and a body in parts. To a certain degree, this is an idea which is just kind of in the air at the point. This is the original poster for Warhol's Chelsea Girls. And again, we've got this kind of female body opening up into drawers and component bits. 
And so what we're seeing here seems to be kind of a woman is compartmentalized body meme going around. In, interestingly, the first issue of IT, which would later publish some of Ballard's works, has an announcement in 1966 for two art shows. One is Yoko Ono's cut piece, which as Julia Bryan Wilson has carefully illustrated, specifically transfers the violence of Vietnam onto the site of the female body in performance. And then a second one, this gigantic woman room created in the Stockholm Museum Modern by Jean Tinguet, Niki de saint Fall, and Olaf Utvelt. So on one level, this is merely representing an extension of the pervasive association of pop cultural imagery and a sexualized, chopped up female body that we find at the origins of pop a decade before in the work of Richard Hamilton and the International Group, and which was very quickly internalized into pop culture. But there's also something very specific about this, which is the compartmentalization of the female body into various chambers or rooms. So a space of interiority divided up into further stacked sequential interiorities. But again, it's this iteration of the atrocity exhibition, the one this one with the compartmentalized body meme that got pulped in the United States. This is the one that was deemed too controversial, too dangerous for the US to bring to market. Instead, we get love in napalm, export USA. So we can see a pretty obvious connection here with Kubrick's memento mori image for the later full metal jacket. In both of them, the hippie generation of psychedelically colored flowers and peace signs has been ground down in the battlefields of faraway Vietnam and the horrors of chemical warfare. The change seems in many ways an obvious enough ruse. America has long held the pornography of violence and the pornography of sex to very, very different standards reflecting perhaps the very distinction between outer and inner space that Ballard's writing and imagery sought to address. Vietnam was distant. Its violence was external. The sexual revolution, on the other hand, make love, not war, was an internal revolution about the spirit and the body. In its radical challenge, was not militaristic, but it lay at the heart of traditional ideas and conceptions of gender in societal roles. The switch to love and napalm allows Ballard's pornography to superficially become associated with the traditional violence of war, rather than with this newly ruptured, thank you, mental landscape of psychosexual liberation and trauma. And that's a good note to come back on. Psychosexual liberation and trauma. So curiously, violence of war was more acceptable in some sense, but it's also this kind of violence that has been discussed much more extensively in the literature on J.G. Ballard. The pornographic has seemed to be substantially harder to come to terms with. So for the rest of this paper, I'm going to look at a couple of different ways of approaching the pornographic in Ballard's novel, largely by examining a single passage from the text called The Sex Kit. I'm going to return to this, one might say traumatically, mm -hmm. certainly repeatedly. The passage comes from the sixth chapter of the Atrocity Exhibition. It's called The Great American Nude. And I would argue that the sex kit is the hinge on which much of the novel pivots. It's a dissociated list itemizing a radically dismembered body. 
In this, it mimetizes the novel as a whole, while offering a prismatic view of identity, endlessly refracting. In this kit, a character, Karen Novotny, is both excessively visible as a collection of partial objects and partial scenarios, and missing entirely. She's simultaneously obsessively mapped and completely unmapped. The characters call this an adequate picture to enable reconstitution, not the real thing, but something even more stimulating. So I'm going to read it as an extended quote. The sex kit. In a sense, Dr. Nathan explained to Coaster, one may regard this as a kit which Talbert has devised, entitled Karen Novotny. It might even be feasible to market it commercially. It contains the following items. One, pad of pubic hair. Two, a latex face mask. Three, six detachable mouths. Four, a set of smiles. Five, a pair of breasts, left nipple marked by a small ulcer. Six, a set of non-chafe orifices. Seven, photo cutouts of a number of narrative situations, the girl doing this and that. Eight, a list of dialogue samples of inane chatter. Nine, a set of noise levels. Ten, descriptive techniques for a variety of sex acts. Eleven, a torn anal detrusor muscle. Twelve, a glossary of idioms and catchphrases. Thirteen, analysis of odor traces from various vents, mostly purines, etc. Fourteen, a chart of body temperatures, auxiliary, buccal, rectal. Fifteen, slides of vaginal smears, chiefly orthogynal jelly. Sixteen, a set of blood pressure, systolic 120, diastolic 70, rising to 200 over 150 at onset of orgasm. Deferring to Coaster, Dr. Nathan put down the transcript. There are one or two other bits and pieces, but together, the inventory is an adequate picture of a woman who could easily be reconstituted from it. In fact, such a list may well be even more stimulating than the real thing. Now that sex is becoming more and more a conceptual act, an intellectualization divorced from affect and physiology alike, one had to bear in mind the positive merits of the sexual perversions. The figure constructing this kid is Talbert, who is, in some sense, a loose sense, the central figure in the atrocity exhibition. He's not quite a character in the traditional senses of the term. Ballard articulates the core identity as Traven, but the figure in the various different chapters appears as a plethora of T's. Traven, Talbot, Talis, Trabert, Travis, Talbert, Travers, with the additional complication that a few of these names had appeared in Ballard's previously published work as well. In an interview, Ballard commented that, in effect, they're the same character, but their role in the stories is not to be characters in the sense that a character in the retrospective novel is a character, an identifiable human being, rather like those we recognize among our friends, acquaintances, and so on. Later in the interview, Ballard brings up the following passage as a portrait of the man's identity, much in the same way, perhaps, that the sex kit operates as a portrait of Karen. And this is another quote. Kodachrome. Captain Kirby, M15, studied the prints. They showed, one, a thick-set man in an Air Force jacket, unshaven face, half hidden by the dented hat peak, Two, a transverse section through the spinal level T12. Three, a crayon self-portrait by David Feary, a seven-year-old schizophrenic at the Belmont Asylum, Sutton. Four, radio spectra from the Quasar CTA-102. Five, an interior posterior radiograph of a skull, estimated capacity 1,500 cc. Six, spectroheliogram of the sun, taken with the K line of calcium. Seven, left and right hand prints showing massive scarring between second and third metacarpal bones. Dr. Nathan said, and all these make up one picture? Ballard holds that these seemingly disparate elements make up a composite portrait of this man's identity. For an era in which singular identity is increasingly difficult, in Traven, we are offered a whole multiplex of contacts with different points. J.G. Ballard stated in an interview, 
regarding Traven, that Traven sees pornography as a type of hyperanalytic response to sexuality, perhaps the same kind of hyperanalytic response that we're seeing in these various kits. Traven takes the view, what is actually going on? He explores what most people, and this is continuing to quote Ballard, would regard as pretty frightening pornographic imagery. He explores it with the kind of eye of a forensic pathologist. He treats sexual desire as if it was something stretched out on an autopsy table. He takes a woman's body and dismantles it, not literally, but almost literally, and constructs a kit, which is literally that. Thus, the sex kit. But while the kit is constructed by Traven, it doesn't figure. Traven or Traubert or Travers or Travis it figures Karen Novotny. Karen Novotny is the sometimes girlfriend of the central character and, importantly, a frequent participant in T's restagings of violent accidents, as well as his various experiments. She's a figure that the T character and others refers to as the modulus, the switching center. Throughout the atrocity exhibition, Karen Novotny offers a centerpiece of excessive visibility. Visibility at its maximum extension in the case of the sex kit. She is photographed, x-rayed, graphed, and charted. He constantly manipulates, transforms, refigures, and represents her body to her and to others. Yet in all of these figurations, she represents not herself, but that which is read onto her. In the planes of her body, in the contours of her breasts and thighs, Talbert seemed to mimetize all of his dreams and obsessions. The sex kit is part of chapter six, The Great American Nude. And this is a chapter in which Novotny's visibility is constantly at issue. She enters into the chapter under surveillance. All week, the tall hunched figure with his high forehead and insane sunglasses had been photographing her with his cine camera. To her annoyance, he had even inserted zooms from the film in his little festival of dirty movies. The landscape Novotny is moving in at this moment is one that is appropriate to the sex kit. It's a sculpture garden, but it's a sculpture garden that is made up of impossibly enlarged pieces of women's body parts, photographs. Mia Farrow, Elizabeth Taylor, segmented into parts and fitted together in frames. And then this display is represented on a smaller scale on the program that Ballard describes. As Novotny tries to escape the surveillance, he stops photographing her, and instead he just watches her. Holding the program she's dropped, he matches the image on the photograph to her body. A fragmented picture of the film actress thus becomes an original document and Novotny herself becomes a secondary representation. Novotny, as she's depicted here, becomes a picture of a fragmented picture. With Karen, as with many of the other figures in the book, the fragment consistently assumes priority in a continuous play of exchange and transformation. The sex kit, again, is a priori composed of fragments. It's a laconic list. It's parts that don't fit neatly together and that double and replicate internally. It offers a prismatic view of identity, an adequate picture to enable reconstruction. Not the real thing, but something even more stimulating. It is a kit, not to make Karen Novotny, but to make a Karen Novotny. So what's on offer? Six mouths, detachable, set of smiles, narrative situations, dialogue, description, analysis of odor, a chart of temperatures, and most instructively, a set of blood pressures. On the one hand, this kit is profoundly reassuring. It offers, in some ways, 
a nearly perfect visibility of something which is particularly difficult to see. In hardcore, Linda Williams suggests that hardcore pornography operates on the principle of maximum visibility, which is an obsessive seeking of the visible truth of sexual pleasure itself. Following Foucault, Williams argues that this push towards visibility is part of the very will to knowledge slash power of the scientia sexualis which positions the female orgasm as itself the confession of an organizing truth. Thus, the reassurance of this kit. It's found a way to make the female orgasm visible. That's its end point, its ultimate object. The representation of orgasm is caught in the gaze of medicine through the staggered blips of rising blood pressure. The confession is, of course, involuntary. It has to be involuntary if it's to be believed. Visibility here is crucial because it allows knowledge and certainty, or rather, truth. This truth is perhaps even more significant in the space of the atrocity exhibition because it is able to serve as a ground or an anchor in a space where such things are hard to come by. The atrocity exhibition is first and foremost a space of free-floating anxiety. How to cope with this anxiety? Lists, organizing documents, photographic enlargements enlarged even further to the scope of landscapes, all for the desire of seeing more. This is the seeing enabled by the fluorescent glow of the scientific laboratory, the harsh illumination of the doctor's office. There is a similar rhetoric at work in the image that Phoebe Glockner is drawn to illustrate the sex kit passage. It appears opposite it in the text. The image shifts uncannily and bizarrely between surface and depth, shifts between skin and a cross-section of underscoring muscle. It also offers some of the objects of the sex kit. The ulcerated nipple, a microscopic view of vaginal smear, a formula up in the corner that could stand in for odor analysis, as well as more conventional pornographic imagery. This image deals in the overtly visible, but it also deals in something which is underneath the visible, something that can't be seen without prosthetic vision. But significantly, the central part of the image is sexual encounter stretched out on an autopsy table, dissected and labeled. This is visibility maxed out, moving past pornography, moving past the terrain of arousal and desire. This focus on the analysis and breakdown of the body into operating elements is a mode of vision which Ballard sees in many ways as essentially fusing science and pornography both of which he sees as kind of rhetorics of maximum visibility. Elsewhere, he would state that science is moving into an area where its obsessions begin to isolate completely its subject under the lens of the microscope, away from its links with the rest of nature. There is always the risk with science as a whole. The pornographic imagination detaches certain parts of the human anatomy from the human being and becomes obsessively focused on the breast or the genitalia or what have you. That sort of obsession with what I call quantified functions is what lies at the core of science. There is a shedding of all responsibility by the scientist who is always just looking at a particular subject with the tendency to ignore the contingent links. Yet, framed as it is by a deadpan scientific rationality, this kid is terrifying as much as it is reassuring, though perhaps less terrifying than the deafening anxiety that it's seeking to cope with. You've got active dismemberment and this kind of nightmarish proposal of a set of semi-autonomous partial objects. Like Lewis Carroll's Smile Without a Cat in Wonderland, the sex kit 
is a deeply, deeply uncanny proposition. Related to what Zizek terms in A Pervert's Guide to Cinema as organs without bodies. They're put in a suitcase. They can travel around on their own. Zizek claims that there's an undead quality to part objects, immortal in its deadness itself. It goes on, it insists, you can't destroy it. The more you cut it, the more it insists, it goes on. This dimension of a diabolical undeadness is what partial objects are about. So the partial object we're seeing is emerging here as something which it is necessary to control and contain. It's done here with tight lines of scientific rationality because control is of continual ever rising importance here. These part objects at their limits act to a certain degree as the very activity of sex does. They provoke the essential question of the limits of subjectivity through a confrontation with the other. The other is both another person brought frighteningly close to our own intimate bodily interiority and significantly the even more frightening other that is our own self, that is interior in the sense that it is inside us without being truly identical with or reducible to us. Lacan called this extimacy, a play on the term intimacy, and Jocelyn Miller expanded on it in a reading of Lacan. Extimacy, he says, is not the contrary of intimacy. Extimacy says the, the intimate is other, like a foreign body, a parasite. Extimacy is the other at the heart of the intimate, an intimate otherness. So where intimacy is the idea that two individual people can be very closely intertwined, Lacan coins this term, extimacy, to express the idea that at the core of the supposedly, very supposedly, self-identical subject that relates to other people, there is always already another person, or rather, another thing that is both infinitely intimate with us, contingent with us, but also distant, because there is no such thing as a self that is identical with the self. Thus, in extimacy, we are not only in a relationship to others, we are in a relationship to ourselves that is usually covered over, except, of course, in moments that cause splitting, such as intense, profound anxiety. So in this, through sexuality, we are not just placed in a potentially terrifying relationship with an other person, but we're placed in a terrifying relationship with another, which is in our own self. Hence, the sex kit again. These part objects meant to make a Karen Novotny do not just render her as her body in pieces. Rather, they articulate a self that is constantly divided against itself. And this, then, is at the height of what the sexual encounter in the atrocity exhibition is. It's used to offer an extreme liminal moment, the moment when you can tear down the boundaries between self and other, which, again, is not a boundary to begin with, but an uncanny dissolution and fusing in which we become aware of the many ways in which the self is not the self. The, self, the sex kit, the self kit, the sex kit does nothing so much as remind us that Traven is not just taking Karen Novotny to pieces, but he's taking her to pieces in such a way that he's rendering a complex portrait of his own identity. So it's a, the self is a portrait of his self as he experiences his own self division, his collection of drives, his bundles of conflicting imperatives articulated as a set of nodes and contacts. So thus, 
One way of reading the sex kit is through this link between science and a pornographic vision, a simultaneous mapping and unmapping of the self. Strangely, one that is completely appropriate to the landscape that Ballard proposes. I'm going to suggest one other way of understanding it, which is as a diagram, a reading that is suggested by both textual and intertextual material. The third paragraph within the chapter begins with the phrase, a diagram of bones. This is a phrase that repeats throughout the text, and it appears elsewhere in other chapters. But initially, it appeared in Ballard's work in an advertisement that he took out in Ambit. As he states in the Marginalia, at the time of writing the Atrocity Exhibition, I was publishing a series of paid advertisements in Ambit and other magazines. Sadly, I ran out of cash, and my application for a grant, I asked for funds to pay for ads in Time and American Vogue, was turned down, which really is a shame because I think Vogue would be improved vastly by some of Ballard's advertisements. The Great American Nude references directly the third ad in the series, which takes a picture from a bondage magazine and superimposes the following text. In her face, the diagram of bones forms a geometry of murder. After Freud's exploration within the psyche, it is now the outer world of reality, which must be quantified and eroticized. So this ad is taken from a media landscape, and then it's resituated in another media landscape as a kind of detournement, to steal a term from the situationist practice, since we're engaging in wholesale theft and appropriation. It's an occupation, it's a transformation. Rather than advertising a product, though, it advertises a Freudian project. The outer world is to be quantified and eroticized. The face, it is underscored by a diagram a diagram which is a geometry of murder, a geometry of death, a geometry of dissolution and unmaking. Visually, in this advertisement, there's a certain similarity between body and landscape, which is in dialogue with the earlier covers as well. They both have similar curves and soft shadows. Significantly, they both burn out to white. The woman's body is differentiated from the landscape through clothing and a mask. The landscape is a horizon of water, dissolving into the sky and into the woman. In this dissolution, it is unmappable. It's prone to continual shifts. This landscape is not one which is readily open to quantification. It can only be understood through its visual relation to the woman's body which is itself oriented through the reference to the diagram. To talk about the idea of the diagram, I'm going to turn to Deleuze. Deleuze famously calls the diagram an abstract machine. And he's writing in much the same time that Ballard is. He writes that it operates by matter, not by substance, by function not by form. Specifically, as well, he insists that it is neither index, icon, nor symbol. The terms are taken from Peirce, who himself understood the diagram kind of within one of these categories. He saw the diagram as an icon, and an icon of intelligible relations in the constitution of its object. Deleuze, as is his wont, diverts these terms in order to articulate that the diagramic or abstract machine does not function to represent even something real, but rather constructs a real that is yet to come, a new type of reality. The diagram is engaged in a process of rewriting both the past and the present, rearticulating time as well as space. And again, specifically, it does not represent. This is a telling statement for Deleuze, 
whose work Difference in Repetition has undertaken a critique of the project of representation as such. Representation for Deleuze acts to consolidate the relationship of subject and object. Difference works in contrast. It undermines the stability of representation and hence the stability of object relations. The diagram then offers something that steps outside of this process, this project of representation. Deleuze goes on to describe the diagram. The diagram is highly unstable or fluid, continually churning up matter and functions in a way likely to create change. Every diagram is intersocial and constantly evolving. It never functions in order to represent a persisting world, but produces a new kind of reality, a new model of truth. It is neither the subject of history, nor does it survey history. It makes history by unmaking, preceding realities and significations constituting hundreds of points of emergence or creativity, unexpected conjunctions or improbable continuums. It doubles history with a sense of continual evolution. The diagram differs from the representational structure in its instability. It operates instead as a display of the relations between forces. In this language, the diagram is endlessly unstable churning, changing, constantly evolving, constantly unmaking. It is the site of both destruction and creation. It is never representational in the sense of fixing and freezing a particular order in place, but is rather endlessly, performatively transgressive. The diagram is the punk of figures, behaving badly and disrupting the social order. We can make a list. The diagram is an open system. The diagram does not distinguish between the artificial and the natural. It operates by matter and function, not substance or form. It is fluid and unstable, constantly evolving. It transforms our understanding of space and time. It tears up history in an endless, violent jouissance. It doesn't represent. It creates anew. In this reading, which Deleuze presents, the diagram edges sidelong towards dreaming of an endlessly fluid social practice. To read diagrammatically, to read the sex kit as a diagram, something which is gestured towards in both the text and the extra-textual material of the advertisement, is to understand it as fundamentally disruptive. It rewrites both past and future through a provocation of instability. It doesn't represent, but rather produces a new kind of reality, a new model of truth. In this case, this particular case of the sex kit, it is particularly disruptive of the idea of bodily boundaries in a way that potentially transforms the idea of bodily limits altogether rewriting self and world, body and machine and landscape as a set of interlocking assemblages, a morass of parts that come together and dissociate in ever-shifting ways. Curiously, this creates a pornographic imaginary that's strangely in line with Susan Sontag's description of the pornographic imaginary in her essay from roughly the same time period. Sontag states that if within the last century art conceived as an autonomous activity has come to be invested with an unprecedented stature, the nearest thing to a sacramental human activity acknowledged by secular society, it is because of the tasks art has assumed one is making forays into and taking up positions on the frontiers of consciousness, often very dangerous to the artist as a person, in reporting back on what's out there. Being a freelance explorer of spiritual dangers, the artist gains a certain license to behave differently from other people. His job is inventing trophies of his experiences, objects and gestures that fascinate and enthrall not merely, as prescribed by older notions of the artist, edify 
or entertain. His principal means of fascinating is to advance one step further in the dialectic of outrage. He seeks to make his work repulsive, obscure, inaccessible. In, in short, he seeks to give what is or what seems to be not wanted. The exemplary modern artist is a broker in madness. Sontag goes on to state that most pornography points to something even more general than sexual damage. I mean the traumatic failure of modern capitalist society to provide authentic outlets for the perennial human flair for high temperature visionary obsessions, to satisfy the appetite for exalted self-transcending modes of concentration and seriousness. The need to human beings to transcend the personal is no less profound than the need to be a person, an individual. But society serves that need poorly. So one way to understand the Ballard of the Atrocity Exhibition is as somebody taking up a position on the frontiers of consciousness and reporting back. The Atrocity Exhibition both represents and presents the idea of art as experiment, art as research, research into social structures, research into gender dynamics. It's the paradigm that would become predominant for art since the 1960s up to the present. Ballard literalizes this idea. Not only is his art a kind of research, it emblematizes this idea through evoking the scientific experiment over and over again, the data collection. So as 70s conceptual art was fascinated by, as well as mocking and parodying, lightly and also not lightly, the informational processes of infoculture and cybernetics, Ballard is looking into limit cases of the pornographic imaginary for dismantling and rebuilding the body. He would later state that pornography is the most political form of fiction, dealing with how we use and exploit each other in the most urgent and ruthless way, and that he is offering a warning against that brutal, erotic, and overlit realm that beckons more and more persuasively to us from the margins of the technological landscape. While the circuits of use and exchange are well lit, one might even say overlit, by the pages of the Atrocity Exhibition, it is also attempting a certain productivity to do with dismantling the limits of the body. This is apparent, I would argue, even in the earliest covers of the Atrocity Exhibition, which blur out the boundaries between human and machinic, between body and landscape and construction. But to close, I'd like to turn to one more kit. Like the sex kit, this is a set of partial objects. This one, however, is explicitly about the development of the human. And it suggests an expanded set through the inclusion of not just human forms, but machinic forms. And the inclusion of not just the mouth, but also the nose as potential sites for sexual encounter. It suggests a temporality that goes forward and also backward. And it suggests as well that this is not a closed set. As parts, these are open for combination and recombination, terrifying and fascinating. They offer different threads of human and machinic development. They offer the chance to do it again, all over again, in a new way. Thank you. Ask you about the notion of the making and, uh, and whether it's very interested with your where you're coming from, like all those that this sort of endless productivity of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. So so is that a, a making could you comment on it? Because 
there might be nothing to unmake from. Or oh, interesting. Anyway, just yes, yes, yes. yeah, that. Oh, that's fascinating. That's such a great point because I mean, this is such a relentlessly fragmented, mimetized kind of set of partialities that you're right. In part, there isn't this stable subject position to proceed to an unmaking necessarily. But at the same time, there is this kind of endless violent jouissance to do with unmaking, with explosions, with destruction, with various kinds of bodily transformation. But you're right. I mean, unmaking may not be the right terminology to use for this in the Deleuzean sense. I'll just follow up a bit then. So it seems that there's always pr endless production. I think you described very well. Mm -hmm. There's a, this kind of this idea of the acting destruction it goes back to Nietzsche mm -hmm. too, right? This idea of the, so so I, it's just I think the the idea of the unmaking is, is interesting, but but it's also instrumental mm -hmm. to challenge the idea that something was stable. To mm -hmm. I don't know. No, that's a really great point because I think one of the things that this text essentially does is to challenge any form of object egoic psychic stability. And I'm thinking about it that way. I'm not sure how unmaking works in with that. It's more this continual fluidity, which is somewhat Deleuzean of this kind of unmaking and remaking as a continual process, but one that never has an established whole to move from, either forwards or backwards. Instead, you're in this constant churn of relationality, which is one of the things I do like about this image is because you've got these objects which are incredibly partial and which are situated to kind of relate in different ways with each other. So I have a lot of questions. Uh, I'm trying to little time to all of them. I'll start first with this body, one of the very first bodies you show, the you know, woman. Um, it was sort of fused with what I actually thought was a sort of card catalog. Um, <laughs> and not that's 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 the always Chelsea Girls? The, yeah. The, what's um, interesting about that? No, that was the Chelsea Girls one, but the one from the, the cover as well. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. That no, looks that's card my book. I can tell it's the scan. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, mine's got the, see the ballard is the red. The, the spines of these ones always fade. Uh, um, it's a very bad one for fading. In fact, almost all the book I reserve mine. But uh, what's interesting about this is the fact that theater in the front and the bodies in the back. Yeah. I mean, how often you see a book cover in which, yeah. the, in which the, the, the most important visual aspect is, is hidden? Right, that's, that's interesting. Well, what about the humor in this book? You know, I mean, it's like, it's awfully funny, too. I mean, the sex kid is also funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's strange. Uh, yeah, well, kind of way. yeah, and actually, so what I was interested in is the way in which it sort of catalogs uh -huh. body parts, right? Yeah. And whether or not that's part of what this is supposed to. Well, the, what's, the name, what's the name of this painting again? I mean, it's Dolly Death, right? It's the City of Drawers or something? Yeah, yeah, but, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's about compartmentalization, no, like organization, it's this crazy structure. Yeah. Which, and I hadn't thought about it as a card catalog, but that also works with the sense of the text oh. as these kind of impacted. Yeah, it was also, uh, you know those uh, European thing where you have the little the little box with all the little drawers in it. You keep uh -huh. your treasures, you know, and if you're well, your friend over yeah, and sure. show them all the goodies that are in there. Yeah. Well, 
Well, what's interesting is they're not just time all of that to get on. They're starting to build the early information systems, early databases for all of that. But, it is but if you were dealing with a computer at this point in time, you would be yanking out right. a stack of circuits right. to look at it and exactly. just pulling out things and pushing them back in. And I mean, I guess the only thing I can compare it to with computers now is like pulling the zip drive in and out. But it's not. You know, in the, uh, in the Mike Foreman cover as well, the duct tape cover, um, he's actually, it, there's 13 illustrations of which this is one of the, the cover one is one of them. And uh, you'll notice that the, uh, this is, he's picked up with a sand dune figure from the, you know, there's one, the story in which Ballard is constantly uh, seeing a woman uh, and confusing her with sand dunes. And I think that's what Foreman was getting at, with the lips in the, in the middle. Um, so I'm also, so as part of that, I mean, to the extent that we can do that as a kind of sign for figure. I think um, it definitely. Yeah. <coughs> um, it's that way. I'm fascinated by these sort of reoccurring themes of women's bodies being tied to technological change, but also to warfare, which mm -hmm. go hand in hand, um, and to violence. Um, and I don't know, there seems to be this sort of like reoccurring violence of the body, and I kept thinking of Dexter, actually, as we were talking about fragmented body parts. You know, Dexter, uh, this TV show, where he's sort of a serial killer, but a good serial killer. Um, yeah, and he like slices people up, right? And uh, as, yeah, part of his, it's an, yeah, I don't know if you want to look at that. But, um, yeah, so that's sort of an unfortunate so thing. Is it of women? Um, not just women, although, actually, no, most of it's men. It's not okay. that he doesn't, I mean, he does slice of women as well. Um, uh, if you've ever read the he atrocities, uses his associate, that's associate exactly. Happy for good. Yeah, he's trained to use his associate yeah. happy, yeah. own, own <laughs> evil. <laughs> but that's mild compared to the atrocities. Yeah, it's um, yeah, so that's a sort of uninformed thought about um, catalog about automation, about cyborgs, mm -hmm. about women's bodies being tied to technological change and to war at this time, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's not just obviously Vietnam, but that goes back to women as computers, right? Right. Or, or World War II, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, I don't have a question. Um, I, it's such a fascinating point at which I always kind of like, down a little bit yeah. because I really want this and I think it is about disassembling and opening up gender. I think that it's not about kind of a binarization but I think that in Ballard's work you get a multiplicity of gender positions yeah. and yet it's always the woman's body that gets to be the landscape. And I mean, Traven T is also chopped up and figured, but the woman figures are much more closely aligned with the architecture mm -hmm. and the landscape, and also with this kind of violent transformation, which to a certain degree gets rewritten some in Crash. But, you know, you see sort of like the, there's two men in the book, really. There's Dr. Nathan, who can't be believed, and like he's a mm -hmm. science pornographer. And then there's a key man who's a neurotic, I mean, essentially he's going, he's a psychiatrist who's going crazy, who's gone crazy, right? So mm -hmm. we, we want to have a whole lot of sort of men, men to deal with here. I mean, I always thought that Ballard's characters were basically Symbols, not people. Yeah. So when you chop up a symbol, where you get, you get a bunch of little symbols. You don't get a bunch of body parts. So it, also the whole thing about you know I don't want to bring in like his past here, but it, the fact his wife died in 1965, and he didn't produce anything for two years, and then he produced these stories and a couple of Vermillion Sand stories up to the time he wrote Crash. I think it's also interesting as well. 
a, you know, just a tale not to tell her, but Mallard himself was going through some unbelievably odd, why did this happen to me kinds of uh, moments, uh, you know, with his, he, he never did get over his wife down. I mean, basically, so, I mean, I, I think it, and you don't want to reach my chin, but there's certainly, Mary is in the, she's in the stories herself, so. Um, and there is the way in which the female body does get tied to this kind of trauma as well, and this kind of recurrence. But I think that's, you know, it's a really, it's, tough. it's a tricky question to figure out exactly what's going on in that. I had recent uh, outings this semester was to tip to see the Cranberry exhibit. Um, and I'm not Where sure. is this? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, so, you know, um, all sorts of films and lots of, uh, 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 God, I'm so afraid to like it. It's kind of a like, exhi exhibition to that. It's a uh, very small time. And, 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 and I never quite, I read Ballard years and years and years and years and years ago, maybe three years ago or whatnot. And I have really picked up Ballard since then. And listening to talk of more looking at images, I was then struck by how Cronenberg it is, or how maybe Cronenberg took some from Ballard. And I don't know. Does anybody know about um, any of the sort of connections there? Was Cronenberg influenced by Ballard? Um, and certainly some of the psycho weird things to female bodies, particularly if you remember the film with the two twins that were the Nasty little gynecologist. Mm -hmm. so really great, great crash. Yep. He waited two years. He wrote a, a script from his memory of it. Uh, which is why it's almost all prone to how much about it. Yeah. But, but do you see, and it's just, you know, there's some interesting parallels. So you know, like, there's some very, and he also um, made what is essentially a version of another Ballard novel in High Rise. Even though it's shivers, it's not the same thing, but there's this really uncanny territorial similarity to the kinds of fields that I'm completely fascinated by both of them as. And I, we were talking about some earlier. I see their kind of their tonality as being very similar. There's a kind of deadpan affect. Mm -hmm. a very intense ambivalence in both Ballard and Cronenberg towards the territory of the body. And I think that is fascinating mm -hmm. in that both of them are choosing at various points to work kind of across horror in science fiction. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Ballard's use of the body is interesting across his entire career, though, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this face we saw a lot of dead people when he was a little kid. So, who knows? But I mean, it's hard to get away from her. Yeah, but an ambivalence, not an infatuation with the flesh, not a disgust for the flesh. This mm -hmm. kind of. But there is that one great line in the acts where he's, where in the Dross exhibition, the chapter, mm -hmm. as you call it. Um, but Ballard says that essentially he just wants to, he wants to take the face of mankind and, and uh, rub it and vomit on a mirror, you know, which is sort of <laughs> good <laughs> 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 way of uh, like the Caliban line. Remember that? No? Yes? Um, so it's like, uh, yeah, I think JG was sort of like, uh, like, okay, well, you know, it's sort of like uh, uh, almost, uh, where he's trying to uh, just reimagine it all to, to, to sort of yeah. get rid of his his own, you know, like you say, anxieties and all stuff. But I mean, it's not just him reimagining his own anxieties. It's also a very complicated sociocultural matrix that he's working to do you think he's conscious of that? Build up. Mm -hmm. Do you think he was self-conscious like that when he was sitting there or writing? Oh, I, 
I don't do authorial intentionality. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are spaces I'm willing to go into with analysis, and authorial intentionality is not one of them. It makes me very twitchy. There was a really great workshop this morning where we talked a bit about Crash and an interview that Ballard had done and a section from uh, the Atrocity Exhibition. And um, I think, yeah, there was a bit of talk about the sort of conflation of the author figure with the story. And it seems like that's something that's coming up again uh, here. And I think it, one of the things that came up was the sort of use of this like scientific rhetoric for Ballard's recognizable voice as a way of legitimizing the project but not as a way of necessarily sort of reflecting his own biographical experience. And so I wonder, you know, even with a question like yours, like, and this is just a question of mine in general, like, does it really matter? Like, would we read the book differently um, if, say, it was untrue, or if there weren't those connections, or if the sort of scientific detritus that he casts out uh, is proven to not be accurate? And I think as uh, has sort of demonstrated, right, that, that the book offers way more than the potential truths that it might reflect, that there is this kind of like a uneasy opening of, uh, of bodies, of just openings in general that sort of are cause for reflection. Um, and I think it, it already came up, and I don't know if you want to speak to this a little more, but um, there is this sense, and, and certainly I think you sort of pointed to this in the end that we talked about this bit this morning about, yeah, the opening of an, uh, an opportunity to sort of like take note and reimagine something, right? And I guess I just wonder, you know, you talked about women's bodies, or female bodies, sorry, in this case. And so when we think about this otherwise, and it seems as though this is sort of a promising ethical opportunity, uh, I just wonder from your perspective, you know, is it still at the expense of particular bodies? And if so, then, you know, should we really invest all that much in what Ballard is saying? Mm -hmm. I do not, and people would doubtless argue with me on this, but I don't think it's at the expense of particular bodies. I think it is about developing and recontextualizing particular bodies. All of the emphasis on scars and mutilations and kind of all of these like weird things that kind of mark a body in its passage through life become for, in these readings, opportunities for new kinds of encounters, new kinds of versions, new kinds of bodies to develop. And so I think that there is a way in which it really opens up to the specificity of individual bodies through, counterintuitively, um, this intense atomization of or a of charting and medically representing a body should, in all rational thinking about it, be kind of a shutdown of sorts. But I think that it instead turns into this spiraling proliferation. I mean, I think part of this, I think part of the focus on, say, different body parts as sites for pleasure is to decentralize pleasure on the body. Mm -hmm. is, to, is to create this sort of, really, in a way, anti hierarchical like this kind of, um, this, uh, this kind of way in which, uh, yeah, the way in which there doesn't become this hegemony around just the generals, even though there is a tension between an attention paid to generals, a focus on the generals while still play, while still uh, and having this sort of focus on other kinds of body parts as potential sites of pleasure. And I think doing that, well, and including things like scars and other things like you know, turning these over, turning the nose over into a site of pleasure, turning the scar over into a site of pleasure when we don't normally think of them, has a sort of 
particular political potential, I think, mm -hmm. in an age of sort of a sexual revolution. It is itself a form of sexual revolution. That, that you know, this thing could become, right, this mm -hmm. kind of pleasurable thing. Is a, it inverts the fist, first of all, from a violent symbol into a pleasurable symbol. Mm -hmm. But it also opens up the anus as a form, as a place, as, as a cycle. And I think that this is something which continues this. And there's also a focus on kind of differing and different bodies in his work that I think is useful, that continues to be useful in thinking about in the contemporary. I the, the advertisement, uh, a diagram of both of his forms of geometry and murder, the, the heading said a neural interval. Um, I, I guess I wonder if you gave any thoughts that interval um, there, and as it relates maybe to, we were talking about the sex kit as a hinge. Um, you emphasize hinge, so I ended up with you. There is, there is a the um, so I think it's the spacing. Keep going, keep going. This is great. <laughs> oh, okay. So I, I, I don't remember it. I, um, I don't remember it as well as I could, so that's why I was going to ask you. But I do think I thought that that hinge was was part of that kind of um, uh, spacing or something uh -huh. in in the journals or whatever it is. And I wonder how maybe that can relate to this neural interval. Eruption of sorts that's not a sign on the side of all this. Right. Yeah. Stuff. I can't okay, I can't go on there about this one. Yeah, I've not done enough of my dirt, obviously. Um but you're right. There's something there about the hinge and its relationship to the frame that I think could be really useful as well. And I had not really thought about the role of the interval. I've, I mean, I've spent so much time looking at like the text on this page, and somehow I appear to have skimmed over interval, which brings up all of these fabulous questions of temporality and the moment, but also this idea of the neural interval. Because, I mean, you're talking about kind of neurons firing, which is kind of, it's this incredibly rapid fire, kind of like no time, time, like a temporality that is incredibly fast and incredibly difficult to measure. And certainly at this time, point in time, they're trying to like MRIs and graphing and um, attaching lots of electrodes to the head to map out exactly what kind of a particular neural interval of the thought might be. And but doesn't that just go back to the whole fact that sex is conceptual? <laughs> uh, the, all the ads in this, uh, in this picture, the three middle ads and the five ads that he did here, the three of them are all, all about conceptual sex. Um, the dangle between two walls has a happy ending ad, which you don't show here. The neural interval, and then there's the one with a naked lady holding the shotgun outside of a trailer. Uh, I forget the head one, uh, but um, it seems to start off with a, a beauty shot of Claire Walsh's face. It ends up with a shot of her in JG's car naked. And then there's three in the middle. Uh, it always seemed to me that the, the three in the middle were uh, the sort of public conceptual kinds of versions of sexuality. And there's definitely something about the sexuality in this. But, but isn't B and D entirely conceptual? <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, I can see where I can see where Ballard is coming from in the it, it, you know when he talks about it being conceptual. I mean, to a certain degree, is it's like Freud's routine about the uh, we're not polymorphously perverse anymore. You know, like why isn't our elbow just as sexy as anything else? Well. I'm going to argue for polymorphous perversity in a moment. <laughs> I'm going to argue for polymorphous perversity and the importance of the moment and this kind of 
weird suspended time of the advertisement as an interruption, something which isn't kind of part of the longer narrative, but a break. And I do think that that word that you just pointed out, this a neural interval, also has something to do with the positioning of this as an act and the role that advertisements play in the psychic landscape. And I also, I do think it's kind of funny. It's kind of the same deadpan. It's hilarious. Humor. Yeah. The, I, the I, other I actually things. did not read it as PMD. I, I thought she was diving. Oh, I thought sure. she was wearing a snorkel. She was going to jump off yeah. into the ocean. Um, I, I didn't, until you said it, it's BMD, I thought, oh. She will get similar arms. Her hands are arms. Well, well, I, 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 I don't know. Yes, maybe maybe it's more. Maybe it's better. Can you see what you expect? I mean, you guys don't remember an ad line. There's a connection between the headline and the art and the text. And the text here, the neural interval, is the time is is the it's it's not about the time about about moving from the inner world of the psyche to the outer world uh, of reality. Isn't that the inner world? Isn't that the sort of like an inner world that he's maybe suggesting here? The time it takes to go from or the, the space it takes to go from one to the other. Yeah, an inner world is, is this moment between two. Yeah, between two things. Yeah. Which in this case is the psyche and the it's the interval. It's the interval. It's the interval. You can actually 